hello. My name is Beth Bauer, and I'd like to welcome you to Meet the Red Cross. For our first segment, we will be speaking with Rhonda Lightfoot, District Manager for the Capital Area Chapter. And in our second section, we will be speaking with one of our volunteers that has gone out on two disaster, national disasters this year. So as we start, Rhonda, can you tell me exactly what, what your role is with the chapter? Well, right now I administrate the Columbia, Missouri, and Mexico, Missouri chapters, which are part of the community chapter, which, which is uh, located here in Jeff City. I also am over the program and uh, services for the entire region. Okay. And as we've moved into disaster season, which has been very heavy for us, how have you seen your role change a bit? Um, it's been heavily uh, with the disasters. We've uh, been pretty much nonstop since December 31st when we had a tornado touchdown in Fort Leonard Wood and Rolla area. Uh, we actually deployed some volunteers there to help with that uh, disaster and then it's just continued since then. Uh, I've been in the state emergency management uh, agency's uh, call center and we're helping them with this new um, Brown that we have, which is Joplin, Sedalia, uh, that's still working with the St. Louis tornadoes and floods, and now it looks like maybe uh, Northwest Missouri may be experiencing flooding. So as we work with SEMA, what is our role in the State Emergency Operations Center? Well, what happens is whenever there's a disaster of like the magnitude of Sedalia or even uh, St. Louis, they ask that the Red Cross be present at our uh, table, essentially, there to help with sheltering and mass care. There's actually different levels. Uh, we have communications, Ms. Uh, MoDOT's there, uh, core engineers, uh, Department Ag, and then us. And we all sit around and we game plan and we work on making sure those communities can get rebuilt. Recently with the Joplin tornado, We've been uh, staffing it pretty much since it happened, and we'll look at probably another week and a half to two weeks being there as a presence. It can either be a volunteer or a staff member who's trained in uh, liaison, the government liaison, and we help out when something happens. Recently, we've helped with a little bit of the donation management that's been coming through for Joplin, just making sure trucks know where to go to offload, making sure we know where those donations are in case someone does have a need, we know which warehouse they're in, and can pull them and put them someplace in Joplin. So have you, as you have worked in the SEAC, um, what, what, have, what have you learned and gained, what knowledge have you gained as a, a staff member that can also help volunteers that are training? I think the, the biggest thing is just the community partnership that I see. I, I'm sitting right next to people from Departmental Health, uh, Ag Services, Humane Society, and we all work together. And it's a neat partnership to see it happening as just one essentially long table and we're sitting there and when somebody says hey we need to have this happen and it may be a little logistics we have to get in with them and work with them and see how we can get it to the area it needs to be but um, it's a great partnership it's uh, rewarding to sit there and know you're helping even if you may be a couple hours away from the actual disaster you're helping coordinate from the state level down to the affected site because at the time when Joplin happened communication lines were down uh, it was, you know, it was something for them to actually get their EOC set up, and then so we were helping out with that. Um, and every day we do briefings to say what's going on, how many people have been affected, how many are sheltering, and uh, it's a neat perspective to be there at the state and see what's happening. So, do you help coordinate Red Cross efforts throughout the entire state? Yes, I do. When you're in the SEAC, you're actually the, the person who is um, helping with that, whether it's a shelter that needs to be open. During the Joplin tornado, we actually got a call in from some of the uh, places still back in the Boot Hill that were still experiencing flooding, and so they need another shelter open. So we actually received that call, took it, and dispatched it to the correct chapter, or tried to help them as much as possible get that shelter open while everyone else was concentrating on Joplin. So there were more things going on than just Joplin at the time. Right, and how, how do you look at the, the different um, disasters that Missouri's having? How, at the SEAC, how do they address that we have Sedalia now, we had St. Louis, we had Joplin, flooding in Southeast Missouri, a potential in Northwest. How do they coordinate all those situations at one time? You know, it, depending on the size of the disaster, it could qualify for state aid or, or federal aid. Um, Joplin, of course, did qualify. Uh, Sedalia's is going to be a state disaster. Um, they, and we hear back on those things during the briefings, and then we 
we tailor our needs and our uh, expectations to those disasters. The flooding we know is gonna probably happen within the next week, two weeks. So we've already reached out to the chapters that are going to be experiencing that flooding and, and giving them the heads up that you might wanna go ahead and start staging some stuff, getting your volunteers called up, what else do they need from us? Because we're already there, so we might as well be going and helping them ahead of time and being proactive. That's good. So um, as a volunteer, how does one get trained to do a government liaison work? What they need to do is come into their local chapter or go online and fill an application to be a volunteer. There is a background check that is involved with it. And once we get those, that paperwork, initial paperwork, we actually put them into a training course. There's a few courses they must have, and then they can start choosing their path. Some people who become volunteers are just really interested in disaster. Some are more interested in the military service. Some are also just interested in just helping answer the phone, but we want them to have the training so they feel confident to be able to help in those areas. And all training's free. Right, so we, the Red Cross provides all the training free, so you can become a Red Cross volunteer at no cost to yourself. Exactly. And that kind of leads me into donations and raising money. Mm -hmm. um, how, how does that work when we're trying to train volunteers? How do donors dollar, donor dollars help us in that situation? There still is a cost uh, to each chapter for this training. We don't want anyone to feel like they have to pay to become a volunteer and help us with our mission. But there is still, you know, there's cost of books and instructors. Um, just even sometimes we get charged for places we want to have the training if we have a large group. So we ask that people who donate to us understand that every bit of the money is used either to help with the running of the office, the actual service delivery of the office, but it goes back to making sure that the chapter is strong enough to withstand its own disaster when that happens. And it will happen sometime along the line, but we just need to be proactive and make sure that we're ready beforehand versus trying to catch up later. We need enough volunteers trained to be able to respond. If someone asked you with their donor dollars if they want them to go to Joplin or, or to Sedalia or to St. Louis or to the flooding or even out of state, how, how do we go about making sure that that happens for them? Well, first and foremost, American Red Cross is, uh, does allow your uh, donation to be donor designated. You can say where you want it to go. The only problem with donor designating is that there are other relief efforts going on. People didn't realize we still had flooding that was still happening in the Boot Hill when Joplin was going on. And we asked people to just say disaster relief on there. And that way it stays in this area or stays where it needs to go, the I guess the need is greatest kind right. of mentality. Um, it's not that it's not going to Joplin, it's just that it's also helping out in other places because the daily happened just a few days after Joplin, exactly. but we weren't seeing that return for donations to Sedalia and they need it just as bad as Joplin does. So putting on your check or, or making it to greatest need or disaster relief will ensure that we have the capability to helping out where there is the greatest need. So. Um what, what volunteers in our area have we actually deployed to the Joplin area? Right now we have eight volunteers and we have both what we call our ERBs, which are emergency response vehicles. They're actually mobile feeding units. They look like large ambulances. You can feed out the side of them. We have both of the ERBs, the one that's stationed in Jeff City, the other one that's stationed in Columbia, with teams of drivers and then the other volunteers that are down there. Um, you know, it's a great organization as far as looking at people and asking for people to come and help. And we like to send our trained volunteers down there and have them help out. Um, I've been in contact with the ones that took the ERV from Columbia and they're just excited to be able to help. And, um, and, and they love driving the ERV, so it's kind of neat to see That's them. That's great. That's great. So if we had a disaster tomorrow in Jefferson City, what would happen? Well, the first thing is that we would wait to find out if we are, our services were needed, and that would come through the emergency management. There's always a, um, what they call an EMD, or emergency management director for each county. First thing that happens is assessment, damage assessment. You know, how many houses, how many people were affected, because until you get those numbers, you don't know what kind of services are going to be needed. If it was one or two houses, of course, we would come in and help, but we would not open a shelter until it got to an established amount of need. Um, if it was a larger scale, we would immediately open, be asked to open up the SEOC, the State Emergency Command Center, and they would actually start directing some of that through there. And then we would 
fulfill our mission, which is shelter, food, clothing for people. So as, as people are looking at Joplin and how tragic it's been, just mon monumental, um, what, what do we have to do locally close, close to home to keep, keep raising money, to keep running the chapter, deploying people, that type of thing? People need to be aware of um, what emergency plans have been made already for them. This is something that happens all the time. We have, a couple weeks ago, we pretended there was an earthquake that hit the state of Missouri. And we literally were playing the whole entire week in different counties pretending to help out. And they would be um, what we call inserts, which they would say like, you know, i seventies closed. Now we had to group team up and decide how to take care of that. but. Everyone who's in emergency um, development understands that you can't plan for every eventuality that happens in disaster because each disaster is different. But we've all tried our hardest to think of everything that could happen and looked at the community's natural talents, as I say. You know, who's a forklift driver here in town? We need to know who they are because if we should have a disaster and the donations come in like they did for Joplin, we need help unloading them. And that's something that happened down there is they had to go out and look for people to help offload. So we're always looking for things like that. Um, the best thing to do is to first become prepared before the disaster. Volunteering during the disaster actually takes away from the actual recovery efforts because then now you have somebody who has to pull off from their job to train people to be safe and to know how to properly fill out the paperwork. So become a volunteer beforehand and get the training you need beforehand because that way you can respond. Okay, great, Rhonda. It's been wonderful talking to you about disaster. And when we come back, we will be speaking to one of our local volunteers that has been deployed twice since the beginning of the year. More than half of America's most important military decisions are made here. No, it's not the Pentagon or NORAD, or the headquarters of Air Combat Command. It's the place that employs over 50% of our armed forces. It's where you work. See you in a couple weeks. So when your employees in the National Guard and Reserve need time off to serve, give them the freedom to protect ours. Here's a question for you. If you're only willing to use your safety belts part of the time, which part are you willing to give up? You could learn a lot from a dummy. Buckle your safety belt. Hi, and welcome back to Meet the Red Cross. Joining us now is Sarah Spillane, and she's one of our great chapter volunteers, so I'd like to welcome you, Sarah. Hello. Um, can you to tell me how you first got involved? What made you want to pick the Red Cross with all the fabulous charities out there? Um, I first came across the Red Cross actually at a business expo, um, the booth that they had set up. It's something I had been debating on doing for a while. I was just trying to fit it into my schedule. Um, I stopped by. I filled out a piece of paper. You know, I told them I was interested. A few days later, they gave me a call, and I came in for a class, and it just took off from there. So when, when you started, did you see yourself as definitely, I want to be in disaster? Did you know that from the beginning? I didn't. Um, it was kind of mind boggling at first. It was so many classes and so much to learn. And when am I ever going to use this? And will I ever use it? Um, I was actually deployed for the first time last year to Tennessee. And experiencing that for three weeks straight a uh, complete eye-opener. You've never experienced a disaster until you really go and see it uh, hands-on with your own eyes, um, the pictures people were taking, getting to talk to the people there, and it was just like, wow, this is what I want to do. I love this. I want more training for it. I want to be able to do this as often as I can. It, it's very rewarding in, in experience. That's good. So have you taken most of your training in Jeff City or have you gone out of the I have, area? I have done almost all of my training here at the local chapter in Jeff City. Um, I did also uh, do some training in New York City. Um, I went to a week-long training session there which was phenomenal. Um, we're 
classes every day uh, in, a, in a week period. They really cram it in, but you learn so much. And that chapter is very unique in and of itself. And so they all have their own little quirks and they put in that really gives you a more broad specter um, than a smaller chapter in this type of area. Okay. So you said last year was your first national deployment. Mm -hmm. And in Tennessee. Yes. And what incident was that? With the flooding in With Tennessee. The flooding. Okay. Down in Nashville. And what was your role? In, in uh, I went down last year as a client caseworker, which is one of the, the two fields that I'm most interested in here. Um, I went out and I met with the clients face to face. We were there to offer um, the financial assistance as we could, you know, to help with the main needs their, their food, their clothing, making sure that they had a plan, that they had some place they were saying that they weren't sleeping in their car or in their houses where the mold was just growing up the walls. Right. Um, you know, sometimes the people we went out and saw, we were the first person they talked to. So a lot of it is just listening to their story. Everybody has a story they want to tell of, of what they went through, and it's different for each person. Um, it really is. Nobody has the same story. I mean, yes, it's flooding. Everybody had water. But how it affected them, it's, it's very different to hear. And as a client uh, case worker, do you feel like there's a part of you that almost has to be a therapist in a way? You really do. Um, you cannot be harsh and just, okay, well, you're the 15th person I've seen today and hey, they all had flooding. You know, it's, it is, like I said, it's different for each one. You know, you have the ones that are in denial and, oh, it's flooding, I'll get over it, it's okay, and you can tell, you know, they need someone to talk to. And then you have the ones that do just want to talk to you for an hour or two hours. And you know, you just have to be there. You have to listen because that is, in a way, their therapy. Again, if you're the first person they meet, they're definitely going to want to sit there and, and, and tell you. They need somebody to listen to make it all into focus and make it better for them. Right. Were you in, um, out in the field or were you in a shelter that the Red Cross was running to do your I was actually um, out in the field and I also worked out of the headquarters a lot in Tennessee. Um, coordinating the teams and making sure everybody had what they needed each time to go out. I also was out in the field um, a few different times and spoke with the clients there and, and heard the different stories of how they were all affected. And when you're talking about client casework and making sure they have what they need, mm -hmm. one of the things that we do is provide them money. Yes. And, and how does how does that work when you're out in the field? It's based um, on their needs. Uh, as you stated earlier, there is disaster assessment teams that go out. Um, client casework is based highly on what those disaster assessment teams bring back. And there's always the circumstances that happen that you will come across. Um, you know, for people that have lost everything, their entire house was covered in water, you know, all the way to the roof. We're, we're going to offer them, you know, the clothing for everybody in the house so they can go and get that clothing. Make sure they have enough food to get them through until they can figure things out. Make sure, you know, with the flooding, um, a storage bin can often be given from us for the few things that they can salvage so they have somewhere to put it and it's not just haphazard in a bag somewhere. Um, there's different things with each client that we offer, you know, it just depends on the circumstances, but there's always something that we can do. References and uh, referrals to different agencies also, as you said, with the Salvation Army, um, local thrift stores, churches. We are very big on getting those and organizing with them. So that's additional clothing and food that these people are able to have access to. Good. Now tell us about this year. Um, where have you been deployed this year? I have been uh, both to Alabama and Illinois so far this year. Um, Alabama was my first tornado disaster I've been on. And while I, uh, Tennessee was flooding, um, it is a completely different scope of disaster to, to go to a tornado. It's equally as damaging, but the actual damage itself is just, there's nothing left. Um, I walked through neighborhoods in Alabama and it was just debris and you couldn't tell where one house was and another house started. It was just street after street and they were just gone. Right. Um, it was definitely very moving uh, to experience that and, and then come back to it and you know be thankful when I get home that I have a house over my head still and it's, it's still there. So. Right. So and when you were in uh, Alabama at the tornado, did you do client casework again? I actually did disaster assessment. Um, okay. That is the other area that I, I do do with the Red Cross. Um, and that is, I'm kind of uh, some of the first teams that we send out to go and see the affected areas where we're getting the calls from um, so we can evaluate. Yes, I mean, these places are destroyed. You know, we do have to keep a record of that so that we can send the caseworkers out to the correct areas and make sure that they've been everywhere. 
but we would walk you know street by street or house by house um, occasionally if it's rural areas you'll do drive-bys and because I was out in many, many rural areas and you spend an entire day and you don't cover much because they really are, but every area, even if it's a subdivision or you know, 10 miles down a gravel road, um, they are affected and we do have to get there and, and make our presence known. So um, in Illinois, what was your role? Uh, Casework there. Case I work. do, I bounce back and forth between the two. Um, and I, again, with the flooding in Illinois, um, so it was very similar to what was in Nashville. Um, I went out and we, assess the client's needs, we spoke with the clients, we offered the assistance that we could for the food and the clothing, the storage bins. Um, we were also offering rental assistance to those um, that we could because of the communities we were helping in to help them get back on their feet. A lot of it, when we are talking to them, um, they, they don't have a direction. They are just kind of spinning in circles and where do I even start, what do I, what can I recover, can I get back, am I going to stay, am I going to move somewhere else? Um, and it, it really is when you go there and you talk to them and you offer this assistance and the referrals to agencies that can also help them, it helps them get that first foot back on the ground and in the right direction. And it's, it's small, but it's what they need to start and it leads them in the right direction. So as you're out um, in that disaster area, whether it be tornado or flooding, um, and you're doing your work, casework or disaster assessment, when you come home each evening or come to the base that you're put in each evening, what do you all do together? Is there a debriefing? Um, how do you talk to each other we about have, what's um, going on? We have debriefings every morning for anything that may have happened overnight, and we also do have them um, at night when we come back. You know, we let our team leaders know or our supervisors know, you know, we've covered these areas, we've spoken to these people. Um, when you go out, especially when you're doing disaster, so you're sent to certain areas, but that doesn't mean if you're crossing through areas and you see the damage that it doesn't get reported. You have to make note of this. And, you know, we'll let people know that, you know, these people weren't on our list, but we came across them and their house was also destroyed, so we helped them. Or we saw this entire um, subdivision and it's been affected and we need to make our presence known there. So who runs, runs those debriefings for you? Um, it's usually the supervisors or the managers that are in the head of each area. You have like the health services, your disaster assessment, the client casework. Um, they rely strongly on the people that are sent out into the field every day to come back and let them know what's going on so they can get um, their paperwork together and, and what they need to know, their information, and they exchange it among each other and they compare and that's how we know every day what's, what's going on and what's been covered, what still needs to be covered, what we still need to do. So you said that this is really fulfilling work for you. Uh, do you sell, see yourself taking more classes to maybe move up to being a supervisor? Or? I am always eager to take classes. Um, this is something definitely um, that I've spoken with a lot of my friends and peers uh, that I want to do. This is more, I mean, it's a volunteer, so I don't get paid, but this is a job that I love. It is a job to me. I could do it every day, and it does not ever get tiring because the look on the people's faces when you're talking to them. And again, you know, you're the first person they talk to. They give you a hug because, oh my God, you just made it so much better for me. Right. So it's, it's heartwarming and fulfilling and full of compassion. So what would you tell someone that's interested in being a volunteer here at the Capital Area Chapter or anyone that sees this? My, my first piece of advice that I did learn is to be patient. It does take some time. You can't just jump right in. Um, it took a few months before I was able to get out because you do have classes, um, as you spoke earlier, that you have to take. You don't get to just go out. You know, you need to know what you're doing and you need to know how to assess the damage or how to be able to help the clients. There's lots of paperwork, especially if you're doing the casework that has to be filled out. It needs to be filled out correctly in order to help them. Um, so just to be patient, get the classes. The more classes, the more you'll know, the better you'll be at it. And when they get the call to go, you'll be ready. And it's just, it's a life-changing experience. Great. Um, would you say that um, volunteers your age are few and far between, or do you see older? Um, I would like people? to think that we are not few and far between, but unfortunately, um, I've seen a lot of my age, um, we are few and far between. And I'm sure it has to do with a lot of people are just busy. You know, I'm a student full time. You know, it takes time out of my schooling to do this. Um, you know, people work full time. A lot of the people I run across are um, elderly and they're retired. and. I got to tell you, they're, they're just as good at it, if not better, though, and they're willing to sleep on that cot in that gym to be able to go out and help every day. They don't complain. But there's a, a wide variety that you'll see.
So you just mentioned sleeping on a cot or a gym. So yes. is that typical when you go out? Um, I'm always told to expect it. You know, every now and then it's nice not to have to. In Alabama, I was on a simple army cot in a gym with about 300 other people. But you know what? That's okay. That was, you're so exhausted by the time you get home, it's a place to sleep. And it, and it is, it takes about three or four days and it's no longer I'm going back to the gym. It's I'm going home, I'll see you tomorrow. Because it really, it becomes your home. You, you get to know the people around you. Um, and, and the cots are in the next row or as you're passing them to go to the bathroom. You know, you, you get to learn where they're from and hear their experiences and you know, get their advice. Maybe you're doing something and you're frustrated because you don't understand it or you're having trouble with it and they know and it's somebody to talk to. It's a good way to communicate and network with other people from chapters all over the country. That's great, Sarah. We really appreciate you coming on today and representing the volunteer sector. And what I would like to say is call our chapter at 635-1132. Call about being a volunteer. Come in um, to 431 East McCarty. Um, you can fill out the information. Uh, as Rhonda spoke earlier, there is a background check. Uh, but you get that information done, and then we can start training you. Because what unfortunately happens when we have a large di disaster is everybody wants to volunteer, but they're not trained. So do it now while, while we have classes going. Come in and uh, support the Red Cross. And again, I thank you for coming to meet the Red Cross today, and we'll see you soon.